Hi, everybody. This is Kate Haley with Glazer's Camera here in Seattle. I hope you're all having a great weekend. Um, we are excited today because we have not one but two Fujifilm events happening today as we wrap up our extended anniversary event. This is the last weekend of our six week um, extended anniversary event celebrating 85 years of being an independent camera dealer here in Seattle. Ooh. So we have Michael clapping in the background. Um, and it's really all of you guys that have helped uh, keep us going through this time. Um, this year has obviously been especially challenging. Um, so I'm just gonna take a moment on behalf of Glazers to thank all of you guys tuning in for your energy, for your support, um, as we continue to kind of uh, navigate the waters uh, that we're dealing with right now, which kind of seem to be like a lot. Um, so before we get started, super quick, um, we do have two events today. Um, one is <laughs> here with Michael, and there is an in-store event. So if you're free later this afternoon, we have one or two slots left. Oh, hang on one second. Sorry, someone's asking me a question off camera. <laughs> um, it'll be a good. Um, but if you're available later this afternoon after, say, 1 p.m., we have like a couple of time slots left for the in-store event happening. Go to glazerscamera.com backslash uh, workshops. Check it out. Um, it's an awesome one-on-one -on -one event with Fujifilm ex-photographer Kara Mercer. But you guys are tuning in because you want to uh, enjoy this lecture that Michael Wabanko is teaching um, and sharing called Photography. And you're looking at the title going, but photography, what's going on there? Well, this is talking about like the art and the graphical elements in images, and he's going to explain it way better than I will. But the concept is to think a little bit more focus on your composition, um, and do more than just taking snapshots. Um, so if you have questions during this, as always, post those in the comments on Facebook or YouTube. We'll do a little bit of Q&A, then we'll wrap the session with some final questions. Um, and with that in mind, I'm gonna introduce Michael. Michael, just tell us a little bit about you and uh, your role at Fujifilm. I know you've been with Fujifilm for a long time. Um, and then we can talk about the, we can dive into your presentation. Sure. I, I, I love how you emphasize that word long time, long time. <laughs> you know? Thanks. Thanks for that. You know, uh, but you're only true. like 25. So I don't know how it could be that long. It, you know, I, yeah, true. It, I'm pushing 30. It'll be 30 years in April. So wow. And and happy birthday to Glazers. But Fujifilm is actually one year older than Glazers. So what? we were founded in 1934. So Dang it. wow. Well, we're like, but, you know, we're all family, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> True. So uh, not to uh, delay things too much. So, yeah, I, I used to run our studio. I'm our in-house uh, sort of our tech geek um, educator. I do video. I do stills. I've been in the movie business for decades as well. Um, and what this is going to be about, and you know what? I'll start with my splash screen so let's see kate you seeing my title slide yep we got it oh goody 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 okay <laughs> so like kate said why is it written that way so the first of all um for all of you i hope there is many 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 of you out there that are not fujifilm camera owners because the next 90 minutes to two hours has nothing to do with camera hardware uh, whatsoever, okay? This is about what makes a good photograph versus just a snapshot. So uh, I've been doing this since I was like 10 years old. Uh, what I'm gonna, this has become burned into my memory, this process of seeing a picture, seeing a picture before you take it, and I guarantee that at the end of this class, you're going to be much, much more successful at your photography, even if you're using a phone, okay? So this is overall photographic techniques that have nothing to do with cameras. So, um, like I said, to me, there is a difference between a photograph and just a picture, you know? I mean, we're, we're barraged with pictures constantly 24 seven now on the internet. Um, 
video and imagery has become more important now in our culture than it ever was before. It's not, not only is it worth a thousand words now, it's replaced a thousand words. So um, in order for you to stand out, if you are looking to be a professional or you want to sell your pictures in any way, shape or form, or just get hired, um, you should learn how to take photographs, not just pictures. So, like I said before, um, you know, there's the old adage, what's the best camera to have? And this, the answer is the one you have on you at the time. These three pictures are actually were shot with my phone. You know, are they phenomenal award-winning photographs? No, but they are definitely photographs. And uh, any one of those, I would feel fine posting on my website. Um, I travel a lot or will be again someday, I hope. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in hotel rooms and honest to God, I'm just one of these wacky people, but because of what I'm teaching you about to teach you now is everywhere I look, I see a photograph. And it's just become this thing that even in hotel rooms, I will find something to make an image out of, no matter how mundane. Uh, and sometimes I actually find that as a challenge, you know? Um, so this is where I'm going. I want you to think about that. So here is a great quote. You should uh, put on your screen, make a screensaver out of it. Henry Cartier-Bresson was the quintess quintessential street photographer of the 20th century from about the 1930s to the 1950s. Um, his most influential book was something called The Decisive Moment. And this guy epitomized, he became the standard bearer for a lot of what we're talking about. His quote, your first 10,000 pictures are your worst, okay? This does take practice. Yes, I like, so 90 minutes from now, hopefully you'll have learned stuff and you will be able to practice it right away, okay? Immediately, you'll be able to go out this afternoon and start practicing these things. But it does take time in order for it to become instinctive. And I hope it will become instinctive with you. Cartier-Bresson also had this to say, which is that he, you know, remember now he said this a hundred years ago, okay, almost, is that painting and photography are different. And for him, the point he was making is that you've got to see the composition before you press the shutter. I really, really strongly adhere to this philosophy. And of course, this was all long before Photoshop, okay? and film was expensive and you had to develop things, you had to print stuff, okay? Um, however, I also disagree with this in that photography and painting are absolutely twins as far as I'm concerned. So if you look at these two images on the screen, all right, one of those could have been a photograph that I had added painterly effect to, okay? The one on the left the landscape, right, with the yellow tones. That could easily be a photograph shot out in the Palouse, quite frankly. Um, and yet the one on the right, uh, it could have been, could be a highly realistic painting. But if you, but look at the compositions and look at the elements in those two images. Tell me they're not the same. The predominant difference is one has a bluish palette and one has a yellowish palette but you can see what's going on in both of those pictures is almost identical. And yet they were created 150 years apart. Now, this is where we're going. All right, so here's a quick summary. First, photographs, I believe, are not accidents. They're part of your thought process, okay? When you approach a subject, you approach it and you move yourself around and you start thinking up, down, closer, farther back, darker, brighter, all of that should be happening in your head as you're framing it up. Uh, you wanna keep the eye interested. So we're gonna talk about the techniques about the art theory that keeps your eye interested inside a frame. It has to have an anchor point, all right? Uh, so there has to be a primary place that your eye goes to first and then decides to wander around. There's a foreground and a background that should complement each other. Again, this is part of keeping the eye interested. And lastly, is I highly, highly, highly endorse 
shooting in black and white as a way of getting these techniques under your belt. If you have not ever tried black and white, all right, I'm daring you, daring you at the end of this class, whatever digital camera you have, put it in black and white mode or shoot raw and JPEG, shoot black and white JPEG, okay? You can have your raw as a backup and spend the next week doing nothing but black and white. And for those of you who are practiced in black and white, I think you know where I'm coming from. But black and white forces you to think about these elements of design that we're going to be going into. So here's a couple of pictures, literally street snaps uh, from downtown LA. Absolutely not award-winning of any kind, but this is a very quick one-two of the thought process. So picture number one in the upper left, immediately there was something that, whoa, a couple of bald heads and there's bald heads in the back, right? And I just thought that's an interesting, you know, human bald heads and mannequin bald heads. I grabbed the shot and as I was pressing the shutter, I immediately felt I can do better than that because in the background, there is the distracting mannequin. You see the far right, the mannequin with the red hair, distracting, have to crop that out. Secondly, the guy in the middle in the lighter colored suit, his hair, his head kind of blends in with the tuxedo and the mannequin. So it doesn't really stand out. So I need to make an adjustment. I move a little bit to the right. I zoomed in a tiny bit. Second picture, much, much better than the first. Okay. The story becomes simpler to understand. Another thing, this was like, I think up like two blocks away. Well, walking around saw this very lonely yellow ATM machine in the middle of an empty parking lot. And it spoke to me, it said, well, wow, that's kind of interesting, this bright yellow glowing icon in the middle of nowhere. So that's the first picture. And then I right away said, mm, I'm gonna cross the street and get closer because I think I can get a better composition. So that's what picture number two was. So you see, these are just street snaps. So we are gonna talk a lot about painting. So um, if you guys can, I strongly, strongly advocate, um, you know, I don't know what museums are open up there these days, but when things do open up, uh, start visiting museums and start looking at painting. So because it's going to help your eye, it's gonna help you get your, your eye better. Some of the uh, paintings that I think are the most helpful for photography is the work of Edward Hopper and Winslow Homer. And basically anything from the 16th and 17th century that's Dutch or Flemish. The reason I po point out the Dutch and the Flemish is because they were incredibly good at doing detailed, detailed brushwork. So their paintings look just unbelievably clear and sharp like photographs. Okay, so like you see those two examples in the bottom, we're gonna study those more in detail. So in terms of hardware, again, I don't care what brand you shoot, it doesn't matter, but know it. Uh, you should, the camera should not get in the way. It should be a way of you helping to get to uh, a fast result. If you haven't played with your camera, if you just bought something a few months ago, like a lot of people did. So camera sales, at least for us, have been incredibly healthy uh, actually since COVID hit. So I guess that means there are more people out there that are uh, getting into the hobby or exploring it in more depth. But take, take the time to take your camera off of program mode and explore what is, what is possible with it, okay? Um, film is still per totally viable. I'm not saying you need to run out and get a digital camera. The best thing about digital camera is you have immediate gratification. But again, shooting film will in fact force you to think about these things better because you don't want to be wasting time and you don't want to be wasting money on film and processing and getting back substandard results. So um, learn a little bit about resolution, what matters. There's image resolution, there's optical resolution, they're not the same. 
Uh, learn about how many megapixels you really need. Learn some stuff about optics. This is all, we're not gonna go into it much. I am gonna touch base at the end of the art theory stuff. I am gonna go a little bit into hardware stuff and image processing uh, just to help, but that's not what this class is about. So we are talking art theory, but I don't want anybody out there to get uh, freaked out about the word art, you know, in capital letters, all right? You don't have to go to art school to do this well, right? Um, the, to me, quite frankly, the standard should be is, would you be happy to take this and take an image and print it and put it on a wall, either in your house or better still, how would you feel, would you feel proud about putting it in a frame and giving it to somebody as a gift. That should be your deciding line on what your, your determining factor on whether your photograph is successful or not. All right. Um, everything else, I don't want you to, to feel to bog down on, you know, I'll never be an artist. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to be tortured to be an artist. Okay. So the theories we're gonna talk about have actually been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So there are elements, and then there's the ways of applying those elements. So these are all photographs spanning uh, over 150 years of uh, the art. And you can see that you can do monochrome, you can do toned, you can do stuff that's full of action. You can do stuff that's very contemplative, right? Um, but all of these things that you're looking at right now are all going to be, are all successful because they satisfy certain recipes, okay? Cert certain elements of the cookery of photography. So I like to make the analogy that a photograph is like, uh, is like a building. It's like architecture. Um, and architecture all adheres to the same principles of design. Architects all learn the exact same stuff. They all start out studying the Greek and Roman architecture uh, and everything else. They learn about basic forms. They learn about basic construction principles. And these two buildings you're looking at are both office buildings. They're both office buildings and they're both 100% functional as office buildings clearly with different aesthetics, but they actually work for their clients' needs when they were designed. Um, so to me, this is what I say is like cooking. We're gonna talk about the elements of design, which are like the basic tools of cookery. Everybody cooks with onions and carrots and, and celeries. It's like an almost every single dish you can come, come up with, right? What you do with the salt and the pepper and the spices and whether it's baked or roasted or whatever, that's what makes different dishes different. So photography is the same way. So these are the basic elements of design. So these are your cooking ingredients. This is your, your, your celery and your onions and you know your salt and your pepper. There's line, we all know what line is, something connects two points, okay? There can be thin, okay, basically there can be thin lines and thick lines, but when a line gets too thick, it's not really a line anymore. Um, color has the qualities of hue and saturation and value and luminance, okay? Um, the color wheel is something you're gonna be, we're gonna talk about. So you should become familiar with that because color can work with, with, one color can work with another color or it can work an, against another color. There's the uh, topic of value, and this is basically light and dark. And the most important word that comes out of value is contrast. For me, I believe that uh, contrast and lines are the two fundamental, the two most important cooking ingredients. But contrast, contrast, contrast is something that I absolutely uh, am gonna try to beat into you. Then there's the topic of space, right? So uh, when two lines basically meet, it creates a space or it creates a shape. And when a line gets too thick, okay, it's not a line anymore. Now it becomes a shape. 
usually a rectangle or if it gets fatter and fatter or shorter and shorter, it can become a square. But the, both of those are brought about by the intersections of lines and the intersections of shapes. Form is what you get is the appearance of three, three dimensionality, all right? And disappearing and perspective is kind of, you can think of perspective as having to do with form. And then there's texture. So texture can be real, but it can be visual as well. And using texture is very, very helpful for keeping the line moving inside your frame. So here's a little art concept that's been around for a couple thousand years. People kind of argue about who started it, where did it come from? It's called the, uh, the golden measure. Um, and you don't have to write down this formula. I just want you to look at the relationship between A and B in that overall rectangle, the A plus B. Kind of look at how that pink area sits relative to the square, okay? Um, and look at then the black and white drawing and look at how those shapes are relative to each other. Right, forget the math. But what's important is, is that the golden measure, the mathematically it comes out to be a ratio of 1.618, blah, blah, blah. But let's cut off the last two digits. The 1.6, that's one and two thirds. The thirds is what ends up giving us the concept of rule of thirds in photography. Um, I'm hoping all of you have heard of it. Maybe some of you practice it. You do not need to be a slave to this. In fact, you should not be a slave to this, but you're going to see this in almost every photo and painting that I show you. It absolutely positively works. So if you're not familiar with it and you're not, you're, you're kind, you need a help with a lot of cameras, especially with mirrorless cameras, uh, go into your menu and see if your camera will let you put a grid up on the LCD or on the in the viewfinder, okay? If it can give you a grid and you're just getting started on this, go ahead, turn it on, leave it on, and you can leave it on forever. But you will find that placing a, the principal object where those lines intersect works almost 99% of the time. It gives you a better picture, okay? But it's not just the intersection, not just where those cross hatches are, but there is the, the, the vertical or the horizontal uh, areas that are broken down into the, the frame. So you have a top third and a bottom two thirds. You have a bottom one third and a top two thirds. This you're gonna see over and over and over again. Here's a quick example, right? These were some uh, pictures shot at a, at a dealer event, all right? So just working quickly, showing people how our cameras work. So um, I don't know if my mouse shows up on this, but um, if you look at the picture on the left, all right, I want you to imagine this image with the rule of thirds overlay on it. So look at where, uh, so we're looking at the picture on the left, the wider shot, her shoulders, fall right where that line of thirds goes. So there's a one thirds above, there's two thirds below. But now look at the bottom, look at where her rear end meets the black stool. That is a third. So there's one third below, two thirds above. You can look at this in different ways, all right? Her head falls neatly on that upper thirds. Now it doesn't fall into that X, it falls right in the middle, but, her head falls into the upper one third of the overall frame. If you look on the right, you see the same relationships. Okay, it's closer, it's tighter, but look at where her shoulders are. Her shoulders are uh, the line that gives us a one third above and two thirds below. Okay. And here in the one on the right, the closer one, you see her face falls into that intersection. Now, look at the angle of the arms and the legs. So this is where lines, remember I talked about lines, lines can be implied. So there's always a line with people, an implied line of where people's eyes are. So let's look at the, uh, look at the picture on the left 
and draw a line through her eyes and notice that it's very similar to the line of her bottom arm, the one that's on the angle from her knee. They're parallel. And you look at the picture on the right, same thing. The upper arm and her eyes are parallel. There's two, in, there's two lines at work there. And now look at the legs. See how the lines of the legs echo the lines of the arms as well. All right, so these are implied lines, but this works in order to get your eye moving from place to place to place. So uh, we're gonna explore a contrast first. So black and white, of course, is the obvious one, all right? We all know what that is. Um, but there is color contrast and it's very real and it's very, very helpful. So there's the uh, additive color wheel, there's a subtractive color wheel. Uh, the one I want you to pay attention to the most is the one that looks like the pie chart. So these, this is the color wheel that we deal with in photography uh, exclusively because we work in what's called a tri-stimulus system. So everything in camera capture is broken down into uh, red, green, uh, red, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, red, green, and blue, all right? Those three colors make up everything that we capture with. Monitors. Your computer monitor, your cell phone, same thing. It displays all color by way of red, green, and blue combinations. So that's the world we live in. But interesting is notice, I want you to look at the opposites. I want you to see what's opposite red, cyan. Look what's opposite yellow, blue. Look what's opposite green, magenta. This is going to be very, very helpful for you with black and white down the road. We'll talk about that. But also, this means you can have those two colors work against each other. They can cause, they can create contrast by way of color without having to have contrast by way of value uh, of, of, of uh, black and white tone, sorry. So basic black and white photography is usually, usually is a darker object standing out against a whiter object. Um, that tends to be the easiest way to find lines because we are more uh, adapted to see black lines against white backgrounds than the other way around. So in these pictures, so those two first two I showed you were obviously black and white images, plain black and white, but look at these two. And now ask yourself, so these are color pictures, but they're not really about color, are they? They're really about black and white contrast. So the contrast in these images brings out shapes and forms and lines. Now look at both of them and I want you to think about that rule of thirds, okay? So the one on the left, the wall, look at the shadow of the lamppost, draw a line through it. Notice how it's very similar in position to the color shot of the woman, all right? The woman uh, on the left set. Notice how they're both in the same place. They both are in one third, they, where that one third line falls, all right? So color, black and white works its way into color. Color works its way into black and white, but here we've got contrast. So the contrast is giving us lines and shapes. All right. Now, the one on the left, the aerial, okay, there's a lot of, there's texture in that, okay. There's not much in a way of lines, but it's all about color contrast. What were the opposites of blue? What was the opposite of blue? The opposite was yellow. The opposite of cyan was red. So you can see how beautifully the contrast of the warm tones with the, with the blue tones work together. Uh, and then there's the line, the curvature of the orange cloud brings you into the photo, brings you down to the blue bottom part. Um, the shot of the seagulls, again, is it a color shot or is it a black and white shot? So clearly the contrast of the, of the silhouette has a very strong contrast against the sky. So here the pictures get a little more complicated but uh, the one on the left, 
um, there is color contrast of the big red form up against the green plants and the green grass. And also it contrasts with the blue sky. As blue is the opposite, or sorry, red is the uh, opposite of cyan. Skies are not pure blue, they're bluish, but they're also very cyan. So we've got ye yellow uh, and against blue, red against blue, and you see the clear shapes and the lines being formed by the plants, by the curve of that red piece of structure. And then the palm tree on the right, well, you know, it's a shot at uh, down at the marina. Uh, yellow and blue again, okay? And using the contrast of the, the palm tree, creating the silhouette, uh, silhouette against the lighter sky creates that line, the elegant sweep of the line. So we've got the really busy foreground, the really busy element of attention, which is the tree itself. And then all the busyness of the lines elsewhere. And you see how the tree is actually in the upper third of the picture, right? So learn to explore contrast. So these three pictures you're, you're looking at are absolutely, they're not meant to be award-winning. They're meant to show you what you get three different times of the day. So um, a lot, I think a lot of us are out walking these days, you know, to get exercise because we're not doing things otherwise. This was just a couple blocks away from my house. It's a fence with a garage three different times of day, all it is, same lens, same f-stop, same camera, same position. And what you get is three completely different results because the contrast changes. So you get three different intents because of where the shadows fall. So when somebody says to you, oh, this is great light, you should ask yourself, mm, maybe later in the day, the light will be better. Because uh, for me, what sculpting a photograph, sculpting with light to me is not about where you put the light. Sculpting with light to me is where you put the shadow. And if you think about that, for any of you that do a lot of portraits and you're setting up the light, you're very careful. You're looking at a person's face and you're moving the light around. You're asking them to look left and right and you're evaluating their face. And maybe you're not aware of it. But what you're really looking at is where do the shadows fall? And is a person have a, a, a wide face or a narrow face? And you're gonna decide on how to shape somebody's face, but the shape is caused by the shadows, not by the light. So these are two really great examples by Stieglitz and by Cameron. You know, one's pure window light and one's a skylight. I love the, uh, the shot by Stieglitz where He's had uh, his friend very, very carefully position his head so that the only part of his face that's getting any light really is the nose. And it creates a really nice triangle. Remember we talked about lines? So look at the triangle of the hands and the tip of the guy's nose. And then look at the triangle caused by the hat. All right? So you've got two shapes there that, that work and lines. He's right smack in the middle. The face is like right smack in the middle of the frame, right? But where, where are the brightest elements in that photograph? The brightest elements are the hands. And notice how they fall very nicely in the lower third of the picture. So with color, all right, so you create shape again with shadow. So the cupcakes, you want to be able to see the swirl. You want to be able to see the texture in the brown cake part, okay? Otherwise, if it's lit too flat, it doesn't look appealing. So you want to learn to backlight, uh, backlight and sidelight, things like that, to create shadows, to create texture. If it's flat, 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 there's no texture. The model on the right is just lit with a single light. Of course, yeah, the background is a window. She's lit with a single light, and it's all about having her lift her head just to the right angle and putting the head at just to the right angle to create just enough shadow under her chin to create the line of her chin. 
Now, there's the, uh, then you can see her whole head is in the upper third, okay? There's the second third, notice where her arm is. Her arm is in the other one third line. And then that grid of the window in the background, very conveniently, you know, gives us some more interesting visual elements, lines and shapes and squares. Okay, balance. Now, this is again to remind you what we've been, what we're talking about is we're taking those initial cooking ingredients, uh, you know, our our elements of the, and we're creating recipes. So the recipe for balance is one that I happen to find very, very tasty. I think balance is important in an effective photograph. So these two, okay, very realistic looking paintings is look at the, uh, in the one on the left, look at the people packing up their cart, getting ready to move. Notice how they're brightly lit. So your eye goes to them first but then look all the way to the left, all right, at that large domed building, which is sort of shadowed in the, in the haze, but it's full of detail and it's very prominent. And also notice how the lines of the, of the, the big apartment structure draw your attention to that building in the background. So you're, you're first drawn to the bright people in the foreground and then you're drawn off to that building off on the left. That big, that cathedral off on the left creates a very important piece of balance to keep that picture from being too heavy on the right. So look at the photo, uh, it's photo. look at the painting of the, the squire with the flag, okay? So the flag brightly colored and there's the, the brightly, that bright red saddle. Obviously the painter wants you to look there and wants you to linger at all that detail of the armor and the armaments. And um, notice how the kid in the pale blue starts to draw your attention towards the background. And then look way off in the background, look at the top. There is that lantern hanging down which has just a little bit of touch of specular highlights. And to the left of that lantern is that bright window. Now, does that bright window need to be there? No, it could have been painted out, but it's enough to give you that element of balance to the top of the frame to offset all the busyness at the bottom of the frame. A couple more paintings. So again, we're talking about the how we use line and texture and shape and form and color and contrast to give us elements of balance. So the painting on the left, the waterfall, look how very cleverly balanced the bottom left corner, which A has the bright screaming foliage of yellow and orange. And notice, you may not notice, so I hope you're looking at it on a big enough monitor. There's two people standing on the cliff, okay? So they draw your attention how nicely balanced it is with the upper right of the blue with the sunset off in the upper right. See how the bright red and the bottom left are balanced by the bright blue in the upper right. Um, and then there's a rule of thirds. The, the dark cliff in the background gives us a, a, a diagonal line of thirds. And then the picture of the painting of umbrellas, the people with umbrella, famous painting. So if you notice, so the people in the foreground are very, very prominent. They're big, they're busy, they draw your attention, but look at that giant massive apartment building up in the off, upper left, way off in the distance. So look at the strong lines of that apartment building and look at all the little detail in the apartment building. It screams out to your, for your attention. So it's balanced. You look at the people with the umbrellas and then at the same time, you also look at the apartment building and this keeps your eye moving back and forth inside the frame. This is important, all right? So taking those same ideas for cityscapes, all right? Bright or bright picture, bright uh, foliage in the foreground, uh, busy, busy, busy LA skyline in the background. So those two counterbalance each other. And there's a nice, the, the, the freeway nicely, you know, points your way through the frame off into the background. 
the the shot at the, on the beach. All right. So um, there is actually something really important that this is just looks like a snapshot. It's a postcard. You know, it's a travel picture. It's not meant to win awards, but. Um, my friend who shot this is a really, really advanced photographer. Notice, ask yourself, why is that tree branch in the upper right? Uh, the, the massive trees. Well, the trees are actually there to block out a bunch of that sky because you want to focus attention off in the middle of the picture. So if the tree branches weren't there, that giant mass of sky would have thrown the picture out of balance because it would have been too, a huge, huge, huge bright area that would have been screaming for attention too much because the beach is partially shadowed. So bringing in that tree allows the picture to feel better. So balance is about making the picture feel right. So here's another couple of examples. Uh, yeah, I've, okay. Um, very, very similar pictures, both downtown LA uh, from a couple of friends of mine. And if you look at the color palette, first of all, the color palette is exactly the same, right? It's grays and blacks and whites and blues. Um, and really similar ideas, a diagonal line with people standing on top of them. Well, there's a couple of critical items of balance here. So first of all, I'm gonna look at the, want you to look at the one on the right of the Disney Center Concert Hall on the left. In the bottom right corner is the little tippy top of LA City Hall. And if you could imagine with your hand, try to cover that up and block out just that piece of the City Hall, you would find the picture doesn't feel balanced. So because of that mass of the Walt Disney Concert Center on the left, which occupies half of the frame, but that little bit of busy architecture in the bottom right corner is just enough to tip the balance to the right. And the same thing with the photo on the left, those people, the silhouette of the people, okay, they're an item of interest and you look there. Now what's interesting is the skyscraper on the left, the white skyscraper in the reflection gives you the balance to those people. So you are drawn to the people that a skyscraper on the left, but then you wanna go back to the people on the right. It's a very, very nicely worked out picture. And look at how rule of thirds works in both of those. So same thing, even in black and white, okay? So the horse occupies the foreground, you know, the body of the horse, the white horse, draws your line to go off into the background where there's way more horses in the background. But look at the two horses on the right. The two horses on the right offset the huge white torso of the, of the horse on the left, okay? The picture of the guy getting a shot of his friends walking off, all right? He stands out, he's a bigger element. So you see the nice lines that draw your attention to the guys walking away. But this guy occupies more of the frame. He's a large, large dark mass in the picture. He's a dark shape, a dark form. And he offsets the busyness of the left of the multiple people. So a little more about ba how balance and rule of thirds actually, you know, this just to hammer it down, is these two pictures are like clear graphic illustrations of the rule of thirds. Okay, I shouldn't even have to point them out to you. So I put up the the, sh the picture of the golden ratio to for you to see how that relates to the rule of thirds. So here we are again. Coming back to rule of thirds is if you look at the aircraft carrier, all right, the, the, the sailor in the yellow falls right in the one third image. The rest of the picture is really, really busy. Okay, fighter jet, your brain goes, whoa, fighter jet. I wanna look at that. So, okay, that's two thirds of the picture. But the guy in the yellow with the color draws your attention back. So your, your eye moves back and forth. Now, the, the, the shot on the right, 
picture from the Mideast, this bright blue Pepsi machine really obviously stands out color contrast, right? Against that gray blob of the Adobe wall. So, uh, but it, notice how it's on the left third of the picture. However, there's another rule of thirds is right at the top of the Pepsi machine, there's that structure that comes out from the wall and the sky itself, all of that are bright elements that draw your attention to the top third of the picture. And a really, really important little bit of balance is in the upper right corner of that, that stucco wall, there's, you see there's a, a something hanging. It's like a, a remnant of a, of a picture or I don't know what it is, a piece of fabric hanging on the wall. You see how there's just a little bit of busyness that nicely offsets the bright blue of the Pepsi machine. Uh, also on the aircraft carrier, way, way off on the right side, there's that one guy standing out there by himself. Again, it's to add a little bit of element to the right to offset the, air, uh, the fighter jet, fighter jet, fighter jet on the left. So if you color up, cover up that guy with your thumb, okay, that's standing on the right edge of the aircraft carrier, you'll see the picture actually feels like it needs to be recropped. So here's some uh, same similar ideas, okay, with some corporate work, um, putting the subject right at the intersection of that rule of thirds is very, very handy. Some color contrast, yellow against blue, some interesting lines, creating some interesting shapes. Uh, you can do that. You do this with product photography. You can see the rule of thirds at work there. This is from one of our ad campaigns for our GFX cameras. So if you think about these two pictures, they're almost the exact same photograph, but I want you to think rule of thirds here and balance. And I did this on purpose. One's vertical, one's horizontal, completely different compositions, yet of the same subject, different time of day, okay? But look at where the rule of thirds falls in both of those in the horizontal one, okay? It's more, it, it's, it's the bottom versus the top more than left and right, yet on the vertical, it's left and right. And you see the strong color contrast at work and you see the strong shape of line. Uh, but with the vertical shot, you see how the climber is right smack at the intersection of those rule of thirds lines. So I, uh, I think I've already mentioned a little bit about that center of interest, the point of dominance. So here's a couple of old paintings. Um, so the one on the left, all right, the, the rule of the center of interest here actually is that bridge at the bottom because it's got the most detail and it's closest to you. But yet there are things that make you move off into the distance like the white church way, way off in the distance and that tree on the left-hand side, make your eye move to the left. And then you see the setting sun way off in the background. So your eye goes to that. And then it comes back around to the bridge at the bottom. At the painting on the right, the center of interest is actually that one odd looking tree that has almost no leaves on it, okay? And it stands out because the other trees are all bushy and leafy. So why is that tree, why is that tree missing all its leaves? So you look at that and then you notice the rainbow in the background. And the rainbow has this nice arch which takes you up to the bright sky at the top. And now your eye is gonna follow that circular pattern because the ruts, the wagon rut, wheel ruts in the ground, bring your attention down to the bottom left and then you come back around to the right. So your eye moves around in a circle with both of these. So the important thing is, is you've got to have the eye moving, but you also have to have the eye, you have to have, give the eye a place to park. If it's just craziness all over the frame, you end up not wanting to look at the picture. So you end up wanting to sort of, you'll glance at it because it'll catch your attention, but then your brain starts to go crazy and your brain just can't tolerate the constant barrage of information. So you walk away. So what we're trying to do is create images that make you stay and make you linger 
You want to linger for a long time. That's the picture you want to buy. That's the picture you want to hang on your wall. That's the picture your client wants on the cover of a magazine. Okay. So again, so looking here, obvious center of interest, a bright red hat on the woman or on the soldiers, the center of interest is the that general with the white pants. Notice how he's in white pants. He's got a white hat. Boom. Center of interest. But then you look at how the line goes off to the right, the other soldiers, and then as they start, and then they, you move off into the distance because the line gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you come back to the guy in the white. So in photographs, so in portraits, this is why, so if you look at the shot on the left, it's a tight portrait. We want it to be about the eyes, this is why we try to have shallow depth of field in portraits. So this is really shallow, okay? It's with the GFX 100 camera. So if you could see the picture, literally only her eyes are sharp and it falls off really fast. And this is why we use, you know, blurry backgrounds as well because we want enough interest. So the interest is the eye, but she's got the pigtails. She's got the blue shirt. So we see things that help us move. We have the kick light, which gives us detail on her hair. So there's plenty of stuff happening in the frame to keep it from being boring, yet we always come back to her eyes. Um, the musicians on the street, okay? So what's interesting, of course, is the guy that's looking towards us. Everybody else is looking off to the right. So we first park uh, at the guy that's looking towards us. But then the other people, we want us kind of, we're kind of, our mind makes us wonder, well, what are they looking off at the right? So you look off into the background, then you come back to the guy who's looking at us. Faces always will draw interest. So if there's a face in a crowd, because we being human beings are programmed to faces, we're always, always, always going to latch on to the sharpest face first. So think about that. So this, these two pictures are really good illustrations of both uh, the center of interest and color contrast and balance all together. So I'm going to talk about center of interest first. So the, uh, the shot from Turkey, the center of interest clearly is the people at the bottom. First of all, you see the rule of thirds. Look at the handy rule of thirds where the people are. And then there's the top rule of thirds where the river is off in the background. Okay. But also look very closely at um, the, the, the color blue in the shirt in the, ba the, 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 the bottom. So that person wearing the color blue draws your attention because if they weren't wearing blue, if they were wearing beige or gray or black or something, you wouldn't look at the people. You'd look off in the distance first. But that color blue grabs your attention and then there's all the busyness of the buildings that move your eye off into the, the, the distance and then you come back to the foreground. Um, the photo on the right, okay, the sort of like the midnight sun picture, the center of interest clearly is the farmhouse, all right? But, and it's almost in the middle of the frame, but you see how the giant, giant mass of ice in the back grabs your attention and then there's the sunlight the sun, and then it brings you back. So I hope you see how there's also uh, sort of the, the, so the color contrast, yet warms and cools working together. Busy streets. So the shot of the skateboarder downtown LA. Well, there, remember I said there's craziness in the background. So if the skateboarder wasn't there and it was just that frame of that corner, you wouldn't have anything to look at. You wouldn't know, do I look at the guy on the left? Do I look at the two people on the right? Do I look at the concert hall in the background? What am I supposed to look at? So the guy in the, the skateboard in the middle is essential to being the point of interest that your eye wants to rest on. But notice how your eye moves throughout the frame. Same with the black and white photo, okay? The gentleman on the raft. So the first thing you look at is him, okay, he's the most prominent form, but then look how, very, very cleverly how all the lines in that photo, draw your attention to that island way off in the background that that guy's looking at. 
And that island, because it is just enough detail to make you want to look at it and go, is that where he's headed? Okay. And then there's the V, okay, how the sky informs that V also draws your attention to the island. So this is a really great picture because it imparts this idea of this voyage heading towards that island. So repetition and rhythm, both of these pictures we've already looked at, um, but I didn't point out one of the things that makes you want to move your eye is on the one on the left is the, um, first of all, the cobblestone. The repetition of the cobblestone creates lines because in the as they get smaller and smaller in the distance, there's converging lines that draw your attention off to the apartment building. And then all the repetition of those windows, those windows over and over and over again in that apartment block also create more and more lines that keep you going off into the distance. And then the, uh, the Mexican general, right? The repetition of all those soldiers, those repeated horses and horses and uniforms, 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 create that line, beautiful line that draws your attention to go off into the distance. These are some really, really old, old, old photographs in the 1850s. So um, I just want you to look at how uh, these pictures had pretty much, you know, this, the obvious rule of thirds going on, of course, but really what they had, these two are basically only about repetition. The repetition uh, is what creates the visual interest in these pictures to, uh, to give you something for your eye to move through. So something way more modern, obvious. So here you see something that's more black and white with just a little bit of hint of color to it. And here you see something that has a strong color element that's very graphically offset by the black and white element of the buildings. And look how in the right photograph, there's just that one little silhouette of that person, okay? Way at the bottom, it's tiny, just enough to give you something interesting to look at. Similar to off on the left at the end of that pier in the distance, there is like a little bit of, there's a foghorn or something like that, right? Little tiny element of interest to, to, to give your eye something to focus on. So in your travel photography, you should be looking at this kind of stuff. So uh, this is why colonnades of trees or rows of columns are always a good subject to photograph because they, they draw your eye into the background, but you need to have something in the foreground that gets you started. I'm not gonna to talk too much about these. I'm gonna let you evaluate them. But I look at here how you have similar color palettes. You have oranges and golds, uh, reds, and, reds and golds in both of these images. And you can see how there's the repetition of the heads. Uh, there's the repetition of the, the drums hanging on the ceiling, um, how the background gets is busy in the, in the busy, but it's not as sharp as the foreground. So your eye wants to come back to the foreground. Harmony and unity is another recipe that I believe in. Um, that's just my particular style. So um, I like it. I like it more when I find elements that complement each other versus elements that fight each other. Um, so in the picture on the left with the laundry, well, they're all pieces of fabric. Uh, they all have re repetitive shapes. They're all, almost all pants. So there's a, a similarity of feeling there. There's very little in the way of the bright red and the bright yellow colors that jump out. Most of what that laundry picture is about is dull, dull, faded blues. And the one on the right, okay, from Asia, obviously that picture is all about grays and tans. There are no strong colors in that picture at all. So you see the graphic elements of rules of thirds of lines and shapes and stuff, but I want you to think about the, how the color sits well. The little tiny hint of color 
is on that woman in the window. She's got a little patch of blue on her shoulder and she's got a blue scarf on. Just enough, just enough to make you want to look there. But overall, the feeling, the, the pictures feel like they belong to each other. So let's come back to this picture of Turkey is you'll notice how there is no color anywhere in that very, very busy cityscape that screams out to itself. There's, there's that green of the tree, but it's a really subtle green, okay? It's not a bright screaming green. The blue of that guy's shirt, like I may have mentioned earlier, is almost the same as the blue of the water in the background. So there's harmony. And of course, all those rooftops and walls are similar colors. The two girls reading the book, it's pink, 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 pink. All right, that's the building block of that photo is the color pink. The white dresses just stand out just enough, just give it enough pop so that you, so they are the center of interest. And of course, uh, remember I talked about repetition earlier. So look at the painting on the background. Okay, so notice how the girl in the painting is looking off to the left and how the two girls reading the book are looking off to the left. They have similar body shapes. So there's repetition there in addition to the fabrics and the folds and, the, and all of that. So, so in a landscape, so there's some, there's unity here in that the rocks are not sharp, jutty, jagged rocks, right? They're soft, blobby rocks, just like the clouds are soft, blobby clouds. Um, the photograph on the right of the old Chicago uh, Stock Exchange. So uh, one of the things I'm gonna show you is back to that thing of balance is if you look at the far, far right, there's that big column with the lights at the top of it that really draw your attention and then the back wall where the clock is. But look at the left edge of the frame, that piece of wall is essential, essential to creating a boundary to the picture. If you were to come in and get rid of that piece of wall, so it's just the roof that just goes to the edge of the frame and just the floor that goes to the edge of the frame. It feels wrong. It totally feels wrong if you crop out that wall, all right? It's because there's no place to stop. So this is really important. But notice how the colors are all similar. They feel good together. Um, so one of the best places to find uh, texture and gradation is fog, smoke, dust, uh, rain, okay? These are great places for you to find texture. And again, what texture is, is about is creating implied lines, is getting your eye to move off into the distance from the foreground. So one of the things to, you should, uh, to help you with fog and uh, rain or anything like that is, um, is it needs to be side lit or backlit for it to show up. If you front light rain, you really don't see it. If you front light uh, fog, you don't see it really, unless for some reason there is a black something in the background, okay? But because they're basically particles that are suspended in air, whether it's rain or smoke or dust, the way to make it work is to have the light hit the particle and get bent around it. So if you uh, tr are trying to find ways to bring out uh, so sprinklers, like sprinklers on golf courses, they're gonna look best if the light is behind, the behind that. So here's gradation and texture. And uh, these, I, I found these two pictures very interesting to compare and contrast because one is clearly just black and white. One is obviously color, yet these are almost the same photograph, two completely different parts of the world. One's vertical, one's horizontal. But do you see how these are could almost be the same photograph? So I want you to look at this. I want you to look about what the recipe is here at work. I want you to look at the elements. And this is what, my, again, my point of all this, what I'm trying to drum into you is, so you find yourself out in nature and you see a stream. Okay, and you see some rocks and you see trees, you see the sky and all that. 
what you need to start doing is in your head, I want you to start going through the stuff that we've been talking about. You're going to decide where am I going to put my tripod? And you're going to decide on how am I going to expose? You're going to decide what time of day is going to make this stuff work the best. And you're going to do all of this, okay, as you're approaching your subject. So more colorful. Uh, this is all about harsh, jagged landscape, okay, both from the Death Valley area. So again, the question is, where do I put myself so I get the elements to work best, so I get the tastiest recipe? So now we're going to sort of, I'm going to try to try to summarize the graphic thinking stuff a little bit. So here we're going to come back to more black and white type stuff, right? So look at the rule of thirds, look at how lines and shapes and forms are created by the intersections of lines. Look at how you can have a little bit of color with mostly black and white. And the same thing now, we mix it up. So now we've got color, 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 and just black and white. But I want you to ask yourself is, you know, try to imagine not what's inside the frame. Now try to imagine what was outside the frame and how did the photographer arrive at getting this frame? So how you arrive at getting that frame is what I call uh, composing with your feet. So um, sorry, somebody was coming. Um, uh, so if you look at this, it's just a boring boat, but it's a boat in the middle of the of, of California in a totally empty field. No idea why it's there. All right. And even though neither of these is, again, necessarily award-winning, the one on the bottom is the one that feels right. So all I did was walk around this boat. And the question is, is how do you position yourself to get the best lines of the boat with the shadows and with the background elements? Because there's like almost nothing to work with in this environment, is there? There's a boat or some way distant mountains and there's a couple of telephone poles. So if you notice in the bottom one, those telephone poles give me that little element of balance with the prominent boat. So you walk around, I say composing with your feet. Uh, this is a bridge I remember in Portland. Um, and this is a question of the same thing, but whether you stand on the right with the sun from the back, or you move to the left with the sun now from the right, now coming in front of you, creating different shapes from the exact same elements and turning it from vertical to horizontal. These photographs were shot literally like a minute apart. And you get one that's far, a far stronger composition than the other. Uh, again, this is in Portland. Um, these pictures are like, you know, 18 inches away from each other. Same exact lens, same time of day, same exposure, same exact subject, yet a quick, a quick move from one to the other. You get two, two successful photographs, all right, just by rearranging the elements inside the frame. And this, like I said, this is the thought process you should be going through. Oh, I see this. Oh, wait a minute. I think I also see that. So you've heard the thing about why should you, you should never put a tree behind somebody's head or a telephone pole because it creates a distracting element. So again, this is the saying, if that was a person's head, all right, is which composition is better? If that's what you're stuck with, if you can't shoot the portrait anywhere else, one of those feels better than the other. And the one is the one on the left, okay? The reason is the one on the right is those lines are literally like piercing the person's head, okay? So you don't want that. So you look at that and you need to be evaluating this in your head and saying graphically, is this, is this a good composition? No, the one on the left feels better. 
So here is an abandoned store, an abandoned food mart, okay? Well, the one on the left might be the first picture you take. And you go, oh, it's, this is really interesting. It's, uh, you know, the, you can tell that it's a rundown place that nobody works at anymore. But it's really hard to read the letters. So if you can't read the letters, you're not getting the story. So you take picture one, your brain goes, I can't read the letters. What should I do about that? Well, all you have to do is raise the camera, okay? Um, or actually it was lower the camera, sorry, lower the camera to get the letters to where they're falling in a different part of the reflection of the window. And now the letters stand out. And now I feel sorry for the people that used to have this business and now they've gone bankrupt. Whereas in picture number one, it's just a bunch of letters with a window. So with portraits, we talked earlier about, you know, how we want to use shallow depth of field to draw attention to people's eyes. Well, I want you to look at this. This is a lesson in overdoing it. Same lens, 56 millimeter, 1.2 Fujifilm, same position focus on her eye, nothing changes except the f-stop. So the exposure changed just for the f-stop. So one is wide open, 1 1.2, one's at 5.6, and one's at f11 uh, or 16. So we know the one on the right, it looks like a snapshot. Anybody can do that with their phone. The problem with that one is everything is sharp. It's not a portrait, okay? It's not, if I was hired by the mom to take this girl's portrait, she'd go, well, I could have done that, right? So the one on the middle is the one that we want. That's the middle, that's the picture we want to sell to the mom, okay? She's about the violin, she's an accomplished musician. You see how we uh, uh, combine the blue of the dress with the orange glow of the tungsten light in the background. So there's color complements. There's nothing directly behind the girl's head to cause busyness. There's the line of the violin takes us into her face and her eyes are sharp. Everything feels nice in the middle, okay? The one on the left, that's the one that's wide open. I'm gonna let you stare, stare at just the one on the left. Is that picture successful? You go, oh, but her eyes are razor sharp, okay? Yeah, but that picture feels completely wrong. All right. In your gut, you don't want to look at the picture. And the reason is the hand on the neck of the violin is so out of focus, so out of focus. We know it's a hand. OK, we know it is. It is so out of focus that it's such a it becomes a grotesque blob. And a grotesque blob of somebody's hand makes us feel uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right. It's too out of focus. The one on the middle, it's out of focus. So it's not drawing attention to itself, but we know she's playing the violin. Yet the one on the left, it just doesn't work. Okay, so this is where you can get carried away with too shallow depth of field. So using the background, using exposure, you know, using tricks of the lens and like sometimes like the, the model on the right, Okay, it's okay to let the background blow out. Why? Because the background in this particular area was way too busy, way too busy. So we don't care. It's about the fashion. Okay, we don't. So it's okay to let it blow out. Um, the one on the left, that same girl, it's the same violinist. Here's a happy medium, you know, between sharpness on the face and the background. It's not completely blurred. So we get a little bit of element of interest, you know, with the tree on the left, but the tree is soft enough that it's not calling out attention to itself. Uh, using your f-stop and using your choice of lens to help decide just how much the background should be blurry. Again, with this, so this portrait on the left of Rita Moreno is the, the background had the little sparkly rhinestones in it for interest. But you didn't want them too sharp, but you want them sharp enough so they actually come out as little points of light, so they feel like stars. Um, 
or the shot on the right, a couple of microphones with the, the, uh, the bass in the background. Well, how much of that background do we want blurry? If it's too blurry, then it's not interesting enough to keep your eye moving. And if it's too sharp, then remember what I said, your eye doesn't have a place to rest because it wants to go to everything. So in landscapes, a uh, lot of time we want to have everything sharp uh, from the foreground to the background. Um, it's, it's more interesting that way because landscapes are one of those things where you kind of do want to see everything. And this is where you have to be careful about where you place yourself. Um, so these and both of these things, the, both the foreground is tack sharp and the background is tack sharp. So for those of you who might be asking yourself, well, how do I get that? Uh, well, first of all, okay, the composition's important, you know, so you've got the right elements, you've got the rule of thirds and contrast and shapes and balance all has to come into place. But how do I get both of those things to be sharp? So most of you think, oh, I just stopped the lens down all the way. Um, and yes, that's the easy way to get everything in focus, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be sharp. And the reason for that is when you stop a lens down too far, it actually starts to get softer. So the resolution starts to fall apart because of something called diffraction. Um, no, I didn't have that. So something called diffraction. So what happens when you stop a lens down too far is it becomes a pinhole camera. So you now have a lens inside a lens. So the real thing, what you need to do is learn about hyperfocal distance. So there is a hyper, there's charts published for every lens made uh, where the hyperfocal is, but the hyperfocal distance basically is the optimum place for you to focus on where you get the most depth of field for that particular f-stop. And, um, the rule of thumb is it's about one third to maybe one half into the photograph. So if I've got something that's six inches away and I've got something that's a thousand feet away, you figure out what's about one third of the way into that. That's where you should roughly place your focus at. Then you start to stop the lens down to bring everything into focus. And then you stop. Once you achieve the best focus with your f-stop, don't stop down any farther. Now you adjust your exposure based on that. That's how you get the sharpest picture. So with, you know, like I said, with these two photographs, you know, you would have, for, you know, the lake, it would have been maybe about the middle of the lake or maybe where the shadows of that island, the reflection of that island are. That's where you focus on. And then you start to stop the lens down. So composition with your feet. This is an important concept because we're talking about balance and perspective and how lines work in a photograph. I want to explain perspective to you here because Many, many people think that perspective is caused by your lens. And I'm gonna tell you right now, and you can quote me, that is flat out incorrect. Your lens does not cause the perspective in a picture. What causes a perspective in a picture is where you stand. It's where you are. Think about how you use the word perspective, say when you're having a, an argument or a debate with somebody. And what you tell them is you go, hey, I really wish you'd see it from my point of view. Meaning stand in my shoes, look at it from over here. Okay, that's what perspective is. So here's an illustration to prove that. Same rundown garage, okay, empty abandoned building with a dead tree off in the background. Now, what I attempted to do here is try to frame the garage to take up the same amount of space inside the frame, okay? But I did it from two different positions. In the first picture on the left, I'm standing closer and I'm using a wider angle lens. On the picture on the right, I backed up much farther and I used a long, narrower angle lens, okay? So wide angle versus long. 
standing in two different places trying to, but I, my point was to frame the garage, okay, as similarly as possible. First thing I want you to notice is look at the roof of the garage. Is notice how the picture on the right, you can actually see the roof, whereas on the picture on the left, you don't see it. The reason is I'm standing so close that the, the wall blocks my view of the roof. So I stand back and I can see the roof. So that's proof that I'm standing farther away. Okay. Now, the perspective I'm talking about is that tree in the middle, the tree in the background. Why does the tree seem bigger? I moved farther away, didn't I? And yet the tree seems bigger. And you're gonna all say, oh, that's compression. That's that telephoto compression. It's not because of the focal length, okay? It's compression, but it's due to math. It's due to the relationship between my, my foreground subject and my background subject. That's what changed. That is what causes the relate the the big the tree to be, feel bigger, isn't because of the longer lens. Here we go. Here's some math. Okay. So, if you imagine the barn is the star. Okay. All right. That's my foreground unit, and uh, the tree is the orange square. So they don't move. They are fixed. They can't move. I'm the blue circle. So the wider picture is I'm standing closer and I make up number. I'm standing 25 units away from the barn. So if you look at the ratio between me and the barn and the overall distance of the whole subject, which is, so is 75, me to the barn is 25, in a relationship of three to one. Now, I decide to move back. I move back, I double my distance. So now my relationship from me to the barn is 50 units. The, the tree hasn't moved, the tree is the same distance. The overall relationship of me to the tree in the back now has dropped to two to one, okay? because the overall distance got longer. It went from 50, it went from 75 to 100. The total distance got longer because the total distance got longer, the relationships shrinks. This is what causes things, this is what causes compression, but it's not because of the lens. I'm simply using a longer lens because I wanna frame it the same. I had to narrow my angle of view to create the same frame because I moved farther away. So here's more proof. Really fascinating photograph, right? The point here in this photograph is the Macbeth chart. So it was uh, hard, but is trying to keep the Macbeth chart the same shape in the picture, just as I tried to do with the barn. So what I want you to look is the Macbeth chart. I kind of want you to look at the background as well. Look at the yellow house, look at the white house, look at the trees, look at that sculpture of the sun on the wall, okay? You notice everything feels really, really similar size-wise and relationship-wise, okay? Don't look at the bottom of the chair. Look from the Macbeth chart up. Now look at what it is. So on the left, is a full frame camera at 50 millimeters. On the right is an APS-C camera at 32 millimeters. Totally different lenses, okay? Um, but they give me the same angle of view. So because they give me the same angle of view, I'm actually standing in the same place. And if you, so now, I decide to use the same lens, 50 on full frame, 50 on APS-C, but on the APS-C, it gives me a narrower angle of view. In order to keep the Macbeth chart the same size, I have to move back. But because I move back, now look at the background. Look at where I drew those pink arrows. 
what happened to the white building? The white building got cut off now. Look at how that sculpture of the sun now is so much bigger in the frame. But the Macbeth chart is the same size. Exactly because of the math that I showed you. It's the relationships between myself and the middle and, and the background. The math changes. So, and here it is. So now same format, uh, uh, standing in two different places because I had to, now I'm fixed with one format. So it's two different angles of view because I'm standing in two different places. So this is very helpful, of course, then. So with portraits, you know, you can shoot a, at a medium distance, say with a 50, 56 millimeter, okay? But in this particular case, um, I wanted to blur the background even more. And I wanted to uh, make those trees, the trees were a little bit, because they're so small, they're more detailed. So I wanted to enlarge the relative size of the trees so they would become less distinct. So I backed up and went to a longer lens, okay? So uh, zooms are great for shooting environmental portraits because you never know where you're gonna stand. This particular case, it was in the backyard of a family's house, had no idea what I was gonna work with. Same, uh, same model, same location, okay, different, slightly different uh, spaces. So wide angle of view, okay, getting up close, why does she seem, why does her head seem so looming in that photograph? Well, it's looming because I'm standing close to her. She's physically looming, okay, in my, in my presence. Whereas in the other one, I'm farther away. So what happens is the shape of the face, um, I'm going to back up to the math here. Um, this math works with faces too, because what happened, here's that compression at work. Even though on the one on the right, she's got her head turned, so it's not quite, but the relationship between a person's nose and a person's ears starts to flatten out as you start to back up. So with uh, my being really, really close to her on the left, the relationship between her nose and her ears is more dramatic, it's more of that three to one relationship. Whereas in the shot on the right is more of that two to one relationship. So her head feels more compressed. What can happen with portraits if you get too long a lens, you end up going really, really, really far back is people's heads start to flatten out too much. And when they start to flatten out too much, they actually start to get feel fatter and wider. So you need to look at a person's face and ask yourself, where is the right place to stand? Don't ask yourself what's the right lens to use. Where's the right place to stand so this person's face gets the most flattering amount of compression? Because it might be a little bit closer for somebody. It might be a little farther away for somebody else. Here's some uh, you know, similar concept. Again similar concepts, deciding what to accentuate, um, how far do you, how fast do you want something to fall off? How should the lines work? And then, you know, composition in color and black and white. Um, these are, uh, I think these are actually, yeah, these are actually slightly different frames. Uh, I remember walking past this gym, it was closed, it was early morning, and the bright yellow wall just grabbed my attention, okay? Wow, I got it. And then I saw the shadows on the wall. Well, as I shot this, at first I was drawn by this stark color, which is cool, and framing it so there was things happening very nicely with elements in the picture. But then I quickly realized that I actually liked it better in black and white, because I found the color was just actually too much. So I recropped it a little bit. You can see the top is a little bit different and the bottom is a little bit different, all right? And I just uh, went to black and white with the capture because I wanted to emphasize the graphical nature in a different way. Here is a photograph of an ascending staircase in a train station. 
And this one, I initially ran, wanted to shoot the black and white photo. I saw this, I saw the pattern of the stairs. I saw the lines, I saw the shapes. I saw how the, uh, the, the, the light in the off towards the, the, the gradation of the haziness off as we reach towards the roof of the building, okay? Carefully set up my composition and say, wow, what a great black and white photograph. And then the opposite thing happened. As I created the black and white photograph, my mind started actually seeing the color in the shot. And I decided to capture it in color also. Um, I myself, just so you know, what to my thought process, I tend to shoot almost always JPEG all the time. Um, I like to get my pictures in camera instead of deciding what I want later. That's me. You guys can work any way you want. But in terms of getting discipline, drumming some discipline into your heads of graphic thinking, I suggest you forget raw, shoot just black and white, force yourself into a particular result, okay? Train your brain. It'll work, you work much faster this way. Anyway, in this particular one, what started out black and white, I'd like to color better. Um, again, similar idea. And here, well, they both kind of work. I mean, none of them are better. Neither is better than the other, but the black and white is a little more effective um, because that green tree, I think, uh, it, it takes a little bit too much attention. So again, with portraits, uh, you can do either or. So in this particular one in the color version, it was about the color palette in matching their wardrobes to feel with like the locations. Uh, but here you can see the composition at work, interesting lines, things repeating. So the tilt of the heads, so they're actually opposite lines, but uh, the line, the, the triangle that's drawn from their nose line comes down to a point meeting at the bottom. You can, sh getting out there at night now, all right? We've got cameras that do basically noise-free pictures at 6,400. So, uh, you know, we didn't, have, we had this problem with film, we had to push it and things didn't turn out great. But now get out at night because there are compositions that exist at night that don't exist in daytime because they're lit completely differently. So the shadows and the, uh, the areas that are accented and what is colorful and what is not colorful exist at night, but you don't see them in the daytime. Get out at night and start shooting at night to practice this, okay? So study these two for pictures. Look at the graphical elements that I've been talking about. Look, about compos look at lines, look at shapes, look at light and dark, look at changes of values. See how this stuff all fits together. Look at balance. Again, using color to work for you. So the one on the right is really only about two colors. It's about orange and it's about blue. However, there is very, very strong lines at work in that picture as well. Same thing with the one on the left. There is a bazillion colors in there, all caused by artificial light. So you guys should learn on how different artificial lights reproduce on your sensor. Your sensor sees lighting differently than your eyes do. Your eyes tend to make everything kind of uh, uh, same white balance, they auto corrects. But cameras don't re respond to lights that way. And now we have a really jumble of lights out there. We've got all kinds of different LEDs. We still have lots of neon. We still have lots of fluorescent. We still have lots of mercury vapor and sodium vapor street lights out there. So it's fun to use advantage of messed up street lighting in your compositions. Um, using exposure to help with the composition. So this is a, a portrait I set up on purpose to show you how darkening the background by using high speed sync with flash helps create, you know, bring the item of interest, which is a person's face and make them more important than the background. The one on the left is not really great because there's too much nonsense going on in the background. 
So by using a higher, excuse me, by using a higher shutter speed, I can create the available light. I can make the ambient light become less important and where the flash is create is what's the primary source of lighting. Because with flash, flash is always fast. There's no slow flash. So therefore flash, the, the contribution of flash to your scene's lighting is almost 100% dictated by the f-stop. So this picture proves that, okay? I didn't change the output of the flash. I didn't change the, 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 the f-stop. All I changed was the shutter speed. So if you have a camera and a flash system that can do high speed sync, it's a really, really good thing to do. Uh, it's also great with action, okay? Especially with biking and skateboarding. It's phenomenal, it's really good. Because you don't want a hot background that's gonna make your picture all washed out. So study as many forms of art as you can. Um, these are some of the Photo photographers that I think you should look at because I think they think as graphically as possible. Um, Ansel and Helmut Newton, Irving Penn, you know, Andy Leibovitz, uh, look up their stuff, buy their books. You know, if you can go to a gallery show to see their work, you should. Uh, but like I said, try to get to museums and try to learn about paintings. Um, I've got uh, just a little bit more. I'm going to talk about techie type stuff. Kate, are there any questions that we should address regarding the art side of stuff? Um, well, okay. So you just had that list of photographers on there. And I know um, I grew up a massive fan of Annie Leibovitz um, because I used to read Rolling Stone a ton. Um, so I was always a fan of her work then. Um, and of course, Ansel Adams, that is a go-to for anybody, especially if you have an interest in landscape photography. Um, so, and I know that you also had like a quote in there from Cartier-Bresson. So one person, Nate, was asking if you had a favorite photographer, like if you're going to look at any photographer's work, like who's your favorite and why? Like, why do you love them? Can you pick one even? <laughs> over, overall, overall, the one that I say, I would have to say Helmut Newton. Okay. Um, just his stuff is it. it, it Annie, Annie is similar to him, you know. Yeah, but, but he he kind of like pushed through he, some barriers that other he, people were doing. He really pushed boundaries, but he has for me. It's see, all right. So let me give you where I'm coming from. So I grew up as a kid shooting black and white film, and this is why this is why I'm so so pushy about this graphic thinking. I grew up shooting black and white film. I learned how to think graphically. So all of this came, you know, got drilled into my head at the age of like 10. Yeah. Um, and Helmut was really, really good with using contrast. He was phenomenal yeah. at using contrast. And just, he could throw a bazillion things into the frame and yet would have you look exactly at the point of interest that he wanted you to look at. Uh, Annie is really good at that too, um, but I find but her, her style's a little different. With, yeah, she's not so much about contrast. She's more about this concept of balance in the frame. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you look at those things, those 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 things where I was pointing out balance, she's really good about having you, hey, look over here, and then having something else call attention to itself over here, and yet. And yet she'll have like just like two things in the photograph where everything yeah. else will sort of kind of disappear and not be important. So she's really good at that. Um, all right. So this is another question that I can tell you who you my know. favorite painter is, though. Wait, I'll tell you who my favorite okay. painter is. All right. Is. Favorite painter. Go. Edward Hopper. Oh, OK. Well, you talked about him before and I agree. His work I is love very Hopper. Cool Every single yeah. Hopper photograph looks like a contempt uh, painting looks like a contemporary photograph. He's yeah. so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kate? Lost you, Kate. I lost Kate, so I don't know if there's any questions. I'm hoping you can hear me. So I will uh, move forward. 
So if any of you guys don't want to hear any kind of techie stuff, you're can welcome you, to drop off. I uh, thank you for joining me. Hey, can you hey, hear me? Batteries. Can you hear me? Now I can. I hear you. Okay. I don't see you. Oh, yeah. The battery in the camera died. So. Oh, <laughs> wah, wah. Wah, wah. Um, just one more thing. And uh, just because I feel like this is something that we all have a question about. Um, um, and, and I, and I, and I, and I, I think, think it's, it's something, something that, that I, know I know for me. So uh, someone was asking about how do, you, uh, how do you realize what your style is? when you've developed a style um, or do other, or if someone else looks at your work, they know that it's yours. So I know for me, I'm just gonna chime in on this a little bit. I think your style evolves over your career. Um, I think that the more you create images, um, you'll start to figure out like the elements that you're drawn to, how you like to edit your work and all of that. So I think that also continues to evolve. Um, and then there will be moments, um, cause I know this has happened to me where people will look at your work and they know, oh, that's your work. That's Kate's work or that's Michael's work or that's whomever's work. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. I definitely feel like a lot of, uh, time goes into it, but I wonder what your perspective is on that, Michael. So you cannot, you cannot, I believe. You cannot consciously set out to develop a style um, because it's an, it's, it's an emotional thing and it's informed also by what your, what your educational background is, what your exposure is to art, to music, um, to, to pretty much everything. You can develop techniques, okay, technical techniques, you can decide, I never, ever, ever, ever want to use flash. Okay, that's a technique, but it's not a style. You can say, I always want to use flash. Um, or you can say, I, I'm going to be 100% black and white. I'm never going to shoot color in my life. Um, now, that is leaning a little bit more towards style. But style comes about from the way you what you're attracted to um, as you walk around and look at the world. And I use that word attracted, not in any kind of, you know, sexual thing or at, at all, but things, certain things speak to your head in, in ways that don't speak to me. Um, right. That's why know, 20 I, of us could walk yeah. down the street in New York and come back with 20 different photos because there's elements yeah. that we're drawn to. So, yeah. 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 Or as they say, you could all walk past the same thing. Five of you can photograph the same, the same fire hydrant in a different way. So uh, there, I'm sorry, there is no answer on how do you develop a style? What you, what I say, what I think is you can ask yourself as you look at other people's paintings and photographs is if you really want to get in touch with yourself is when you're looking at something, why do I like that? You know, you may hate Ansel Adams. I mean, some people just don't care about him. He's like, yeah, okay. It's a great picture of a mountain, you know? Um, and to a lot of extent, I, I'm not, I, I think he's very important to study, but he is not, to be honest with you, one of my favorites. Um, uh, so, that, that's what I think what you need to do is I think you need to ask yourself questions is why do I like what I like? Uh, and just let that live with you. Let that live with you. But it's not something you can consciously walk around and go, I'm go going to shoot it like this. If you try to shoot it like this, then you're just copying somebody. What's the point of copying somebody? Um, I'm going to give you an anecdote. Um, so, I was uh, up at um, I was up at Jackson, Wyoming, at the Grand Teton, been there a couple of times for some workshops, and there is a famous spot in the Snake River, in the bend of the Snake River, out in the park, that Ansel Adams made favorites. Yeah, I and know the exact shot, shot of, you're talking about. You know the shot. It's yeah, it's the, shot. the reflections of the snowy mountains way off in the distance. 
and there's a bend in the river in the foreground and the mountains are reflected in that, okay? And I forget what time of day it is. I think it's sunrise or sunset, but anyway, it's a stunningly beautiful photograph, really stark, you know, the, the foreground is black, the mountains are white. It's just, it is a stunning image, okay? And when I was up there and I thought, hey, it might be kind of cool to see where that is. Okay. And I always thought one morning, okay, hey, I think I'll get up early and I'll go there and I'll do that. Okay. So I got up at like five in the morning, drove to that spot and got out of there as fast as possible. The reason is I am not making this up. There were 50 cars all yeah. parked on both sides <laughs> of the road yeah. and at least 50 photographers all with their tripods all trying to get that absolutely shot. four inches next to each other all in that same spot trying to get the same exact photograph yeah so i'm sorry if you're one of those people that have done that i don't mean i'm, I'm not i was just like i was like uh oh nope i ain't doing that <laughs> what's the point of doing that okay i don't want to get the same picture everybody else gets yeah. So I drove off and found beautiful other stuff to photograph instead. And now, yeah. you know, it's the same thing. You know, the Palouse is a famous place to go photograph. There's workshops that go out into the Palouse all the time. And we have ex-photographers that are guys that will take you there. Okay, well, just because you're at one particular spot that everybody else shoots photographs at doesn't mean you necessarily have to take that photograph. Right. Or maybe look in the other direction. If everybody's looking here, Maybe you should look over there. Yeah. So that, that is where I'm going with that is that's what style is about. Okay. Uh, I think style is having the comfort with yourself to not try to be everybody else. Well, and I think that, um, so your anecdote, it, it rings true. I was in Yosemite for the first time a couple of years ago. Actually, when I was driving down to LA for the Fuji Film Festival that was in LA that year, um, and um, it was my first time in Yosemite and I kept thinking, okay, I'm gonna get like all these, I'm gonna try and find some of these shots that Ansel Adams created, but he spent years exploring that park and finding those spots. And I had like two or three days. So I shifted gears and was just like, well, I'm gonna explore this park the way that I wanna explore this park. And maybe one of these days I'll get back here and try and find some of those like really well-known spots. Um, and I ended up getting out to uh, the park at sunrise, like before sunrise one morning, and I saw these lights on one of the, I think, it, I can't remember which peak it was, um, but it turned out there were people climbing, you know, one of the mountains, of course, and this guy who lives basically right there was on his motorcycle, and he had binoculars, and he was like, oh, well, look, you know, he loaned me his binoculars, so I could see like somebody climbing the side of this mountain at freaking five o'clock in the morning. And it was really, it was, that experience meant as much to me, if not more. So, yes. you know, I think, you know, what you're saying is, is so true because, um, and then when I, t I have a travel workshop I teach and that's one of the things I talk about is just like your perspective is so important when you're going to a place that has been seen by tens of thousands of eyes and photographed a million times. How do you make it yours? Um, is such a crucial thing. Yeah. Um, so um, did you ha did you have more on your presentation or um, was let me that kinda... I had yeah I know we We're have about 10 okay. minutes left. Yeah, let me hang on a second. Let me take a quick look. I was going to talk about some more technical stuff. But let's see how much of this. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, I can do this fast. Okay. So it's some tech techie stuff. You guys don't want to tune in. Thank you for joining. We're going to get me. super technical leave. now, folks. Hang on. <laughs> but ask not questions. Super tech. No, not super <laughs> tech. Just want, but since we're talking about stuff about I want you to understand how can how our digital camera, how to get the most out of your digital camera so you can get to all this stuff. And like again, why I tend to shoot JPEG because I don't feel I need to shoot raw. But first of all, be aware that um, you know the way a photograph starts out, your raw file starts out as basically a bunch of numbers. You can't see a raw file, 
Uh, what you see on the back of the camera is always a JPEG representation of the raw file, but we have a different sensor pattern in our cameras than everybody else does. I'm making a point of that. I'm not saying ours is not gonna make an advertisement, but the way our files get processed by softwares are different. There was there is a long mis mis uh, misunderstanding out there that um, Lightroom in particular that that our raw files don't process well. That is a myth from ten years ago, when we first came out with the sensor that I'm showing you on the left, the X Trans. Adobe couldn't figure out how to demosaic it. So again, all the software companies they demosaic the raw files based on their engineering not from the camera manufacturer. Camera manufacturer does it in camera, but the software companies have to figure it out on their own. So way back when, Adobe had a nightmare trying to figure out how to demosaic our pattern because our pattern was nothing like anybody else's. So for a couple of years, there were problems with Fujifilm raw files being processed in Lightroom. That problem went away a long time ago. So. For anybody out there who still says, I'm never gonna to touch a Fujifilm camera because they don't, they come out like crap. It's not true, okay? Um, very quickly about frame, uh, you know, we have medium format cameras, bigger than a full frame. There's M4 thirds. I don't care what sensor size you shoot. What sensor size you shoot doesn't matter for any of these uh, principles of composition and perspective and balance and light, it's irrelevant. What it does give you is it gives you choices over how much depth of field you end up in the picture because of the lenses that you end up using. The lenses are what cause the change in depth of field, not sensors. But uh, to some extent, there is a bit of uh, changes with noise and dynamic range, but I'm, you know, pretty much nowadays, all the sensors are gonna give you a good picture, but it primarily comes down to lens choice. Um, Resolution. So you probably heard we make a camera that's under two megapixels that's just barely bigger full frame DSLRs out there. Okay. So there was resolution hundreds of years ago. If you were to look at like these paintings that I'm sure you in the museum and walk right up close, which you can do, they used to use brushes that literally had like one single strand of hair. These guys were, you talk about resolution, they would paint with a single strand hairbrush to make these things as realistic as possible. So that's where you need resolution. If you're gonna make, be making big, big prints and you wanna be able to walk up to it, that's great. But if all of your stuff is destined for the web, you don't need 102 megapixels, okay? Um, so, do we want you to buy the camera? Yes, but let's be realistic. You don't need it, okay? Um, but optically, you should be aware of lens resolution is different than sensor resolution. And your pictures, if you're using older lenses, if you're using stuff from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, those were designed for film. Film never needed to be very sharp because film itself was not really sharp because film had thickness. So it was impossible to actually get a totally, totally sharp picture on film because there's multiple layers of emulsion. And you had grain. Grain would get in the way of the sharpness and you could never see optical, optical sharp uh, resolution. So lens designers from way back when could be lazy. Uh, you take one of those old lenses now and you put it on your 24, 50, 100 megapixel camera and what you're going to see is a soft picture. Now, talk about technique or style. Maybe you like that. So you can use that. But if your technique or style is about getting lots of sharpness, you're not going to get lots of sharpness because what's going to happen is things are going to blur. And remember, I talked about stopping down too far. Stopping down too far causes point causes point spread, diffraction. Um, I'm gonna skip this, skip this right. So, um, 
flare, older lenses would have lots of internal lens flare because the lens coatings weren't all that good. So if you're about getting maximum contrast because of your style and your technique, get a modern, use modern lenses that have really good coatings. What, is it, what does it look like? So if you look at these three histograms, the one on the right is what you get when you have a lens that has a lot of flare. So blacks end up getting washed out because there's so much light bouncing around inside the lens, the blacks get washed out. So your histogram ends up looking like that where there's no really black in the picture. You've just got grays and whites. Um, point spread or diffraction or lack of sharpness in a lens gives you the image in the middle where the where lines end up blurring together. And again, your histogram will look like the one in the middle where there's are actually gray tones where there are not supposed to be any gray tones. So uh, learn to work with your, that, and this is, I'm gonna stop on this. One of the keys to getting successful shots with uh, JPEG, and this will help you with RAW as well, gives you less work to do with RAW, but learn how to expose your picture correctly, okay? So mirrorless cameras are great because if you have the image preview set on, okay, then what you see is what you get. If you're, if you're overexposing, you're gonna see it's too bright. If underexposing, you're gonna see it's too dark. So you really can't make a mistake with a mirrorless camera if you actually have the function enabled to let you see the exposure properly. Um, but the, one of the keys to that is learning how to read a histogram. So I know our cameras put a histogram right on the screen, but not all histograms are normal. A normal histogram is something that's based on something that has a predominance of middle value tones in the picture. You know, if you've got a white wedding dress on a white background, your histogram is all gonna be to the right. It's supposed to be to the right because everything in the picture is white, okay? So learn to interpret histograms based on the subject, but they're very, very helpful. If you get the picture with the correct exposure and you get your picture with the correct white balance, you can start throwing your raw files out the window. I'm just saying, because I, um, I like to make my life easy. So, and we'll stop there. Any questions? Right now, um, so, Real quick before we wrap this up, if there's any last minute questions, please feel free to post those in the comments or the chat. Um, and while uh, we're doing that, I'll just a quick reminder that if you registered for the session today, that you will receive an email shortly after we wrap with a special promotion that's only good this weekend, like super secret, super special promotion. So be sure to check your email um, shortly after we wrap up today, or you can come into the store um, and take advantage of that offer a couple of bonus surprises for today. Um, we are also doing an in-store event today with the opportunity to work with Fujifilm X photographer Kara Mercer on creating portraits with not just one, not just two, but three different lens options in the Fujifilm <laughs> lens lineup, including the brand new 51.0. So if you've been curious about that lens, we have one or two slots available starting at, I think, noon. Um, it is a paid event. Um, but the way it's designed is there's a small fee and we're going to give you that fee back in a form of a coupon towards Fujifilm gear as well. You're going to get to work one-on-one -on -one with Kara and a model and learn a little bit about posing, have the opportunity to try this new gear. And it's a super, super sweet deal. We also have, uh, we have the rep here, Jeff Hinzey, who, uh, also has the XS10, which was just announced. So we have a demo. We only are going to have it available to look at today. So if you're curious about that new camera, um, it's pretty awesome. So you could swing by and uh, take a peek at that today too. The store will be open till six. I think Jeff will probably be here till about five. Um, and uh, I will say I did have the opportunity to uh, shoot with it a little bit and it's really fantastic. It's um, to quote a friend of mine, it's like a baby X-T4. So it does a lot of the things the X-T4 does. Um, in a smaller package and at a ridiculously good price point. Um, so with all that said, uh, check out what's happening here at the store at glazerscamera.com backslash uh, workshops. 
Um, we, like I said, this is the last live event as a part of our anniversary event. Um, today is the last day of that. There are, is a promo again on Fujifilm, but you can only get it if you signed up for this session or call the store or come in. Super secret, can't be promoted online. Um, we just have some comments thanking you, Michael, for all the awesome information and examples of not just photographs, but paintings to help people right. think about things a little bit more. Um, and I will thank you on behalf of the store for your time and energy and all the sessions that we've been able to put together for the last few months. Um, and we'll get more on the books as we get into the holiday season. Um, so thank you, Michael, and thanks to everybody at Fujifilm for helping to make this happen. Um, and with all that said, um, have a great day, Michael. Enjoy the rest of your day. I hope it starts cooling off down there in Cali soon. Um, and we will talk to you soon. Everybody right. uh, tuning in, uh, thank you again for joining us through this crazy uh, extended period of live events. Many of them are up on our YouTube channel, so go there and check them out. Um, and check your email for that super special Fuji promotion. So, Michael, thanks again. Everybody else, have a Cheers. great day. Bye. <laughs>